We have a very exciting program today, focusing primarily on the tragic events uh, of 26th of December 2004. Um, and uh, the session is entitled Case Study of Differential Vulnerability in Thailand and Phang Nha Province. Uh, we're going to, we have four papers to present, but we're going to begin with a short documentary film. So um, I'm going to move into an audience seat so I can watch the film. Um, so we would like to start with a 15 minute um, documentary about the 2004 Asian tsunami. So it's a compilation of different video clips that I try to put it together. But so the quality might not be that great, but, um, but here it is. So it starts with the initial BBC report about the news um, tsunami. Good evening. More than 11,000 people are now thought to have been killed in Southern Asia after an undersea earthquake sent enormous waves rolling across the Indian Ocean. The quake measured 8.9 on the Richter scale, the biggest in the world for 40 years. Waves up to 10 meters high engulfed the coasts of many countries. The quake's epicenter was off the island of Sumatra in northwestern Indonesia, where more than 4,000 people are thought to have died. In Sri Lanka, officials say more than 3,000 people have been killed and more than a million affected. In southern India, 3,000 people, mostly fishermen, are reported dead. At least 300 have been killed in southern Thailand, including some tourists, and hundreds of people are missing. And waves swamped the low-lying Maldive Islands, leaving the capital Mali two-thirds underwater. Gareth Furby reports. The cause of this disaster lies in the pattern of tectonic plates dividing the Earth's surface. The boundary between the Indian plate and the Eurasian plate is especially active. Where the earthquake struck, the two plates are colliding, forcing the seabed to jolt by as much as 10 metres. The effect was felt right across the ocean, the quake generating a series of tsunami waves. So how does this compare with pre- But the plates are interlocked. So That's why clip when is they explaining shift, the jerky movement along the edges so that separate them the earthquake, causes what we call If the earthquake earthquakes. happened under sea... Most of the earthquakes recorded in the world aren't very strong. But sometimes, a particularly great one causes destruction and death. Earthquakes also occur at the sea bottom. When that happens, they can sometimes displace the water column and originate waves. These waves are best known by their Japanese name, tsunami, which simply means harbor wave. Regular sea waves caused by the wind are very different from tsunami waves. Let's find out why. Wind blowing over the sea can only move the upper layer of water, forming waves but not affecting movements deeper down. The water particles near the surface move with a circular motion which helps to propagate the wave along. Deep down, the water particles don't move. The strength with which these waves reach the coastline depends exclusively on the movement in the first few meters of water. A tsunami, on the other hand, can be generated at the bottom of the sea. In case of a strong earthquake, the sea floor abruptly deforms and vertically displaces the overlying water. The entire water column is disturbed by the uplift or subsidence of the sea floor. This sudden movement releases a great impulse of energy, which is transferred to the whole column of water between the surface and the sea floor. In this case, the water deep down moves as well, as deep as 1,000, 2,000, 3,000 meters. Apart from submarine earthquakes, tsunami waves can also be generated by underwater landslides or when rocks or sediments slide into the sea, by volcanic eruptions or more rarely when a meteorite falls into the sea. Alarm systems currently in use in the Pacific and Indian Oceans give advance warning when a tsunami is generated. These systems rely on sensors placed at the sea bottom which measure variations in the water above and transmit an alarm via floating buoys and satellite link-ups with observation stations on the coast. Once generated, tsunami waves in the open sea travel very, very fast, up to 800 kilometers per hour. They can cover thousands of kilometers and approach coast far from their point of origin with great energy. In the open sea, 
The waves are rarely over a meter high and are very long, so they're imperceptible. A ship in open sea, for instance, wouldn't notice anything out of the ordinary. The speed of a tsunami wave depends on the depth of the water the wave is traveling through. Approaching the shore, the tsunami's speed diminishes, although it's still much, much faster than an ordinary wave. Also, wave amplitudes will increase dramatically. This is due to the fact that the tsunami's energy flux, which is dependent on both its wave speed and wave height, remains nearly constant. Consequently, as the tsunami's speed diminishes as it travels into shallower water, its height grows. This huge and fast-moving mass of water shifts an entire column of water from the sea floor to the surface. Approaching the coast with a destructive force far superior to any wind-generated wave, it can advance hundreds of meters inland. That's why, even if it isn't very high, a tsunami wave can still cause serious damage along a coastline. When the trough of the wave first reaches the coast, the tsunami appears to make the sea withdraw, often quite consistently, leaving harbors and beaches dry. This can last for several minutes and is a sign to get as far away from the shore as quickly as possible. The crest of the wave will arrive at any minute. It may look like a sudden high tide that keeps getting higher or a wall of water moving faster than any normal wave. It carries with it the energy of the earthquake, not that of the wind. This is exactly what happened along the coast of Thailand on the morning of December 26, 2004. A tsunami generated by the strongest earthquake of the past 40 years off the island of Sumatra spread death and destruction along the coasts of the Indian Ocean. Cangannya itu memang di luar yang sudah sudah pernah kita rasakan di Aceh. We decided to just stay outside for a while because of the earthquake. So we wait for a while. And then I, was, I saw hundreds of people then. They, they, running, uh, they were running from the sea. They look scared, very, very scared. And they were screaming. to feel scared because I saw a giant wave. It's higher than my house. across the robot we stood here and the tide suddenly risen six seven feet just yeah just suddenly come across the robot we stood here look at the waves right over there in that bay look. i know it was like a riptide that would have gone all around the bay there was a commotion we heard a commotion on the beach and dave mentioned the wave or something I'm shaking me, dude. There was no warning. If I'd have seen a big wave coming in, I wouldn't be stood on that wall. I managed to get out on the other side through a hole in the window. I grabbed this tree top and I saw people hanging on uh, to balconies and walls around me. I will never 
forget those screams. I can explain it really. It was like screams from people dying and that kind of screaming. My wife looked at me and said, hey, what's going up there? The, the water's gone. And in so short time, ne? strangely quiet. It looked like somebody had taken the plug out of the sea. And people were drawn to it because it looked so strange. There was a sense of calm. There was no sense of panic whatsoever. You could see forming up from left to right beautiful crescent on the horizon. It looked quite lovely. We were spellbound. Everybody was looking at it. But at that time, there was no way to know how big the wave was. Die brechen da hinten und die Wellen, die brechen da hinten auch heftig, oder? Alter Schwede. I filmed the scene again and again. This time. I was in a special way fascinated about it. Guck mal da hinten, Schnigi, wie das hochpäscht. Das Wasser. I said to myself, hey, what a perfect wave. Hammer. Was da hinten abgeht. Nein. Aber da hinten, da geht, das ist ja Wahnsinn. Das ist richtig. Vom Lockbund, der ich halt jang dort, nachab dort mir, mir, paar Jung. Oh, die Boote hier, die, die Militär. Was ist das? Das Fischerboot da hinten ist gekentert. Boah, was ist das? Ja, Tsunami. Oh. That was the moment I realized that you are really in danger. Come, we must go. We must go. Nach hinten, come. We must go nach hinten. And then it just went straight over one of the ships. Now, in that moment, I knew how big the wave was. So that's when I started running. I ran into the lobby. I grabbed one girl and said, go upstairs, because I thought, if it's bigger than that, you can't outrun it anyway. The sea had just come in. It was like the hotel was a boat, and around me was the sea. And I could see the wave heading directly to where my house and family were. I phoned my 
wife and said, move, move now. I think that's all I said. And the phone went dead. And then I started to break down and cry. I thought that if I had the faith that they would be okay. So after Kaula, Kopipi, then tsunami wave um, uh, sent out across all the Indian Ocean, as far as Somalia, Kenya, and Tanzania, 10 hours later. So it uh, basically affected 11 countries along the Indian Ocean coastline. And um, this is the, the number of um, people missing and, and dead, so the highest um, impact was in Indonesia, Sri Lanka, India. In Thailand, it was estimated to be roughly about 5,400 deaths. Yeah. And, and that's the, and this is also one of the reasons why we chose Kaunak as the um, conference venue. It's the 10 year anniversary in 26th of December this year. introduction. I don't know about you, I wasn't quite prepared for that. I've seen similar footage of what happened when the tsunami hit Aceh, uh, but it's still uh, really very dramatic. And um, what strikes me is just the complete, sorry, I thought it was the uh, complete unpreparedness of people, that people just didn't have any clue as to what was happening. So uh, that's the very meaningful background for the sessions uh, today. And we will now switch uh, temperament, so to speak, and um, uh, go through the program. We have four papers in this session. And the first paper is by uh, Nopon Witorapang, uh, Raya Butarak, and Wirapon Potisiri. And I believe Raya is going to start this paper, and then uh, Nopon will, will for uh, most of the time for this presentation of this particular paper. And the paper is entitled The Role of Social Capital on Disaster Risk Ma uh, Reduction in Southern Thailand Coastal Zones. So, why are you going to start? Um, I just take another couple of minutes and then I would go away. <laughs> um, so what I want to say, you might have heard about the Indian Ocean earthquake in 2012. Um, it was almost as big as the one in 2004, and the um, epicenter was so not so far away from Banda Ache. So the the scale of the earthquake was 8.6 um, Richter on the scale, and that also triggered a tsunami warning alarm across uh, the countries on along the Indian Ocean coastline. Um, me and my co-author, we happen to be here. Um, in Panga on 11th of April 2012 and we were in um, Panga Town Hall we were actually sort of trying to collect some data with the um, community members so because we were in the in Panga Town Hall at half past three in the afternoon we af after the news of the earthquake so we received um, straight away the warnings, so they faxed to Panga Tao Hall from Bangkok, the, disaster, uh, the Department of Disaster Prevention and Mitigation. So we know precisely if tsunami is going to happen, what time it's going to hit Phuket, and then move on to Panga, and, and then so on. So we sort of had time what to react. So what me and my co-author did, so we thought, because we were in the town hall, we have this information, but what about the people along the coastline? Did they get such information like us. So what we decided to do is first run back to Bangkok. No, well we decided to go back and then um, make a quick, rapid um, questionnaire design and, and return to this area. So it was the period of still a lot of other shock for about 20 days. So 
people also felt the earthquake. Yeah, so it was a period of a lot of uncertainty. So we um, we decided to return to the area and then interview um, nine villages along the Panga coastline. Um, what did they do? Um, how did they hear about information? And how did they prepare for that? Um, maybe. I just want to show a quick video that explains the difference between the 2004 earthquake and the 2012 earthquake, why tsunami didn't happen. Absolutely. We're, talk we're talking about two different plates here across the region coming together. Now, the way they interact is what causes the earthquake. I want to take you back to 2004. This is the storm, excuse me, the earthquake that we saw here. It was between a 9.1, 9.3, very close to land, as you can see right here. The other ones we had today were back here. Now, why this was so devastating back in 2004 is because these two plates, we have the Eurasian plate as well as the Indo-Australian plate coming together. And what happens is one goes below each other and the water is actually displaced. So that is very, we didn't know that when this earthquake today happened. Now today, I want to take you and show you what happened here. We're looking at two uh, earthquakes, one the major earthquake as one as a aftershock. 8.6 as well as 8.4, a little bit further away. Uh, as you can see right here, we did have some uh, aftershocks, as you can see some smaller ones. We will continue to see aftershocks for the next several days. That is normal. But the difference is between the previous one in 2004 and this one is it was more of a horizontal slip, as you can see right here. And in this situation, we don't have any displaced water or minimal displaced water. So that was the big difference. We didn't know that immediately until more of the analysis came on. So that is why now we are looking at all of the uh, warnings have been dropped across the region. But as you said, the area was well informed here uh, compared to what happened in 2004, as well as course technology has incredibly improved in this region. Thank Indeed. you. Thank you very much, Kevin Carvel. Absolutely. We're, talk we're talking about two different plates here. Thank you. Um, all right, uh, so the, the following the traumatizing <laughs> um, tsunami clip, I already forgot my presentation script, so I'm actually gonna, <laughs> I'm actually gonna um, uh, well, um, improvise here. All right, the uh, the title of the presentation is actually uh, the title of the paper. Um, it's actually been changed several times. I, I think that was still the old title. I apologize. Uh, um, the, 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 the latest title is Social Participation and Disaster Risk Reduction Behaviors, Case Study of Tsunami Risk Areas in Southern Thailand. Um, basically, we changed, well, we were trying to avoid the word social capital because we understand that demographers basically have uh, a particular definition of social capital. I'm an economist by training, so obviously my definitions are slightly loose. <laughs> um, so so um, with that disclaimer, I think I'll, I'll go on and, and, and talk about the presentation. So I'm from the Faculty of Economics at Tula. Um, Raya, and, uh, Raya is a sociologist by training. Um, Vira Pond is a demographer. So when, when, when Raya was uh, uh, referring to a co-author, she, she actually meant Vira Pond. They collected the data together. I, um, I basically, all I did was um, to run the analysis and, and the, the interpretation and everything. All right, so basically, right, um, what we want to do is we, we want to, we have two goals in the paper. The first one is to explore the determinants of disaster risk reduction behaviors and to explore the determinants of social participation. So that, that's basically the first goal. Okay, the second goal that we have is to actually investigate the relationship between social participation or social capital, as I say it, and risk reduction behaviors. Yeah, so we have two particular goals and I'll, I'll go through each one of them. I'll refer back to the research questions as I go along as well. All right, um, with the clip um, that Raya just showed, I mean, you realize now that that's, um, uh, um, 
extreme national events, tsunamis, um, they're, they're actually, they've, they've been gaining momentum in, in academic research. Uh, coastal communities are particularly vulnerable and um, I think it's important, therefore, for us to basically understand how people um, undertake disaster risk reduction behaviors. All right, so there are basically two main ways, and this is my own classification, there are two main ways to actually try to minimize damages um, that come with the environmental disasters. The first one is what I call the macro level. This is when you actually have um, someone providing non-excludable public goods, for example, um, an early warning system, the improvement of the forecasting and warning system. And when I say that, I'm basically referring to the fact that once the good, prov once the good gets provided, obviously uh, the c uh, you, c you can't diminish the consumption of the other people. So if you have an early warning system, everyone in the community is actually going to benefit. So that's what I mean when I say non-excludable. Right, and there's also the micro level, which is basically the main point of the whole paper. The micro level is when, the, uh, it's when you look at the individual's action and how that action actually um, minimizes environmental, uh, sorry, minimizes the damages um, that are done to you um, in cases where um, natural disasters happen. All right, so examples of micro level um, efforts include, for example, uh, storing emergency food and water supply, purchasing insurance against natural disasters, and obviously um, the uh, disaster risk reduction behaviors, which I'll talk about. All right. In the literature, all right, um, they, um, when, when we were doing this, we were actually looking at how social capital or social interaction or social participation are being defined. And we see that there, 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 there's a variation of definitions. So the, the, it was the, the first definition that we look at is social capital as embeddedness in social networks. And I think this is basically this, the, the, the terminology or the, the, the definition that demographers basically adhere to. So you look at social capital as the characteristics of the community, right? So, um, and we know that social capital helps with um, disaster responses. How? So we we um, we actually get a couple of examples. The first one is that in a society where you have a high social capital, obviously um, there will be sharing of expertise and resources. Okay, um, there will be transmission of information. Um, there are supporting policy and practices that contribute to greater preparedness and effective responses. Yeah, so that's the that's the macro level that I was referring to. Right. There's there's also a different definition of social capital, and I think this is basically um, what um, people outside the field of um, demography and uh, uh, basically adhere to. And this is the one that I'm actually going to be using. So I uh, person I think of social capital as a characteristic of an individual. It's something that you basically invest in. Um, and, um, and social capital as a characteristic of an individual can actually be passed on from generation to generation as well. So it's possible that your parents basically have a lot of friends, in which case, I mean, you are surrounded by a lot of people and you learn the skills of actually um, interacting with other people. Um, Examples of such uh, and in the literature include um, um, the paper by Riyad, Norris, and Ruback in 1999 uh, when they actually looked at residents in Charleston and how and how um, upon the, the hurricanes, uh, Hugo and Andrew, and those people with stronger social ties, people with stronger social support, um, they were more likely to evacuate before the hurricanes hit. Um, we also look at, uh, there's, also another uh, there's also another strand of paper where they look at how membership in, this, uh, in the social organization basically increases the support uh, following, um, for an, following disaster. So let's now look at what determines the two, um, the two things that I, I, I'm, I'm try we're trying to look at in this paper. So as I said, we want to look at the determinants of disaster responses and social capital, social capital, social participation, right? So we, we go through the literature and we see what's, um, what variables are basically statistically significant in the literature. So those variables include personal characteristics, obviously, like age, gender, marital status, the number of children, education, etc. Um, there's also economic circumstances circumstances, income, um, um, home ownership. There's also, there's also another interesting variable that we found in the literature. And 
Um, and we want to highlight this because we're going to refer back to it a little bit later on when we talk about the results. Um, that's the disaster experience, and which I sort of look at it as a psychological factor. Okay, so we know that the disaster response um, sort of is correlated with disaster experience a little bit, but the magnitude of which depends on a number of different factors. So, for example, uh, uh, the number of disaster experience, the more disaster you've experienced in your lifetime, the more likely you're going going to actually um, take some precautionary measures yeah? uh, or how recent the experience one uh, how recent the experience was uh, the, the, the more recent the experience was um, the more likely you're going to undertake um, precautionary measures now and um, disaster um, um, disaster experience also has an impact on social capital as well it can actually erode social capital in general because um, once once disasters uh, once disaster hit obviously people get dislocated they they go um, in separate ways in which case um, the, the, the the members of the society the makeup changes all right and then uh, or social capital can also be renewed um, because with um, such uh, trauma traumatizing experiences, obviously people come together. The conceptual framework that we're going to look at in, in this particular um, paper is, um, there's, sorry, there's supposed to be an arrow right here as well. So um, I converted this thing into a PDF and the arrow was gone. But um, basically we, we say that we think that the individual characteristics and the community characteristics, they both impact social capital and disaster risk reduction behaviors. Yeah? Um, and then there is actually also one other thing, which is unobserved characteristics. The, um, um, these also impact social capital and disaster risk reduction behaviors as well. And we treat social capital and disaster risk reduction behaviors as outcomes that are being simultaneously determined in the model. Uh, I'll explain what that means in a little bit. But when I talk about unobserved characteristics, um, um, I refer particularly to unobserved heterogeneity, some sort of preference that you can't see in the data, yeah. But um, but it would actually be captured in the error term. All right, um, Raya talked about the Indonesia quake, uh, which basically caused earthquakes in Panga, that's the study area of this particular paper. So um, the quake actually occurred on the, the 11th of April, 2012. Um, so I'll, I'll skip this because um, what she talked about it already, and um, basically uh, the the quake uh, impacted a number of different areas actually. But we chose Panga particularly as uh, the case study, um, the the and, and that was for a strate uh, strategic reason. Um, out of the six affected provinces in 2004, Panga was basically the worst hit of all. Yeah, so we actually wanted to look at you know um, people who had been living in the area and, and um, how exactly they were s were, um, how exactly uh, they um, basically uh, under um, how exactly they undertook the uh, precautionary measures. All right, um, and in two thousand and four, in Panga alone, um, this I think the the figures here they. They slightly differ from the ones that um, that uh, Raya showed, but uh, this this was basically from the department of uh, uh, the department of the disaster prevention and mitigation in, in Thailand. Uh, uh, in Panga uh, alone, about six thousand people died to the tsunami um, in 2004, yeah, um, and about seven thousand hectares of land were completely wiped out. Um, in 2012, though, right. Um, seven out of um, 48 sub-districts in Panga uh, were issued tsunami warnings and evacuation order. So what, what they did, uh, Raya and the other co-author did, was um, they basically w went down and they looked at the seven sub-districts that actually got issued tsunami warning. They actually went, to the, uh, went into the area about six days or five days after the, the earthquake <laughs> happened um, and, they, and they did a flash survey. Okay, they collected information from 30% um, of the household that were, uh, that were in the nine villages randomly selected from the seven sub-districts. Um, and the 30% the 30 of the households were also randomly selected. So the, um, I would imagine that the, 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 you have to correct me if I'm wrong, <laughs> but uh, 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 the, the, the sampling design is basically three-stage. Yeah, so you do, you, do you do sampling at the, 
at the um, the cluster level first, you, uh, me meaning the geographical subdistricts, um, and and then you and then you do another sampling at the at the household level, um, and then and then you basically talk to one person uh, in the household. Yeah, so it's it's basically individual level data set, but one individual comes from one unique household, right? We also, when we when we when we did the analysis, though, we supplemented that data with the village level data um, that we got from the 2010 population and housing census from the Ministry of Interior. Um, uh, the reason why we actually chose 2010, not 2012, was because the 2012 um, is actually unavailable. They only collected this, uh, the census every. Um, um, ten years, yeah. So, um, but uh, hopefully that wouldn't impact the analysis too much, right? Because it's only a two-year difference. So the the main dependent variables that we're trying to look at are f there are four dependent variables, as I said. So the first three are disaster um, risk reduction behaviors, and the last one is um, social participation. So the first, um, the three, the, s the three disaster preparedness measures are uh, whether or not someone follows the news about the earthquake. Um, the second one is whether or not someone prepares evacuation kits or forms evacuation plan. The third one is whether or not after the earthquakes um, that person would actually express the desire to move away from the area completely. And with social participation, we measure that using uh, whether or not someone regularly participates in um, village-based social events. And you can see the percentages here. <laughs> you can see the percentages here. And you can see that the percentages become actually lower if you, if you consider the efforts that it takes to actually take that precautionary measure. Listening to the news, for example, is actually an easy task, right? All you have to do is to turn on television and then you hear the news, yeah? So a lot of people do that. About 60% of people actually, um, when they did the flash survey, they actually followed the news. Um, and then about 37% um, actually formed evacuation kits, and um, w um, with the desire to move, it, it came down to about 20%. Um, about 74% of people basically participated, reported participating in village-based social events uh, regularly. Okay. Um, we also look at um, personal characteristics as well. I'll, um, for the purpose of time, I'll, I'll have to. So skip this a little bit. Um, so we look at personal characteristics, we look at household characteristics, and we look at village level characteristics. Um, I want to highlight one thing. All right, um, that is, there is actually this particular variable that we um, generated, and it was whether or not someone had lost a family member or had an injured family member in the 2004 tsunami. Uh, and which is basically a dummy variable in the model. And it says, according to uh, the survey, that about 45.8% of the people um, who had experienced the 2012 earthquakes in the, in the, in the nine villages that we surveyed um, um, actually had, um, had had a traumatizing experience or had lost someone or uh, um, had, had had injuries um, in the 2004 tsunami before. So this is the disaster experience variable that I was referring to at the beginning of the presentation. All right, the empirical model, what basically what I do is, uh, because we have four different um, variables that we're interested in, um, what we do is, and, and they're all binary variables, right? So, what we, so obviously, the, the, the natural inclination is for you to use probit. But because we think that these variables, uh, somehow, th the outcomes are jointly determined. So instead of actually running them as separate regressions, like four separate regressions, I basically ran them in one go and, and used um, the joy distribution, the joy normality distribution instead. Um, so the model that we're using is actually a multivariate probit. Okay, um, multivariate, multivariate in the sense that we're actually using um, joint um, multivariate normal distribution of four different outcomes. So we were looking at the we were looking at how the error terms here are completely correlated. The structure of the error term is, is this. Okay, so this is this is the error terms, and there's a, the the variance covariance matrix at the back. So we have the mean of the mean of each error term is still equal to one. Uh, sorry, is still equal to zero. Just like you would do, you, just like you would assume under univariate um, normality, um, and then the the variance is actually equal to one. But there is also the covariance, which is the row. Typically, the row is assumed to be equal to zero when you look at um, individual um, regression. But right now, we're basically making an assumption that the row may not actually be equal to zero. So when we were running the regression, in addition to actually getting the coefficients, which is the basis that you normally get, we also try to find um, the the row 
roles as well at the same time. And there are six unique roles that we actually have to find out of the, the four combinations. We only look at the, the, the lower triangular uh, metrics. Yeah? Um, so we use simulated maximum likelihood, obviously. Um, um, and we found that all the roles, they are um, jointly significant, so which basically justifies the fact that we can use multivariate probit. Um, once we actually ran the analysis, we, c we got the marginal effects. And I want to highlight a couple of different um, things. So um, as we're referring to, um, the bad experience in the 2004 tsunami actually showed up positive and stati statistically significant. So these are marginal effects. Yeah? So basically what uh, the interpretation would be for you to think of these things as impacting the probability of, of, of undertaking a particular um, action. So here you, I would interpret it as if you had had a bad experience in a 2004 tsunami before, all right, the probability that you would actually listen to your news would actually be 10.3% um, higher than if you had not had a bad experience in the 2004 tsunami. Yeah? And the same thing applies with the intention to move in social participation as well. Right? Um, we also found some really interesting village level characteristics in, in, the, in, in the model and um, we're, we're um, playing around with a bunch of different um, village level characteristics and we found that the percentage of female population in, 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 the, in, the, in, um, in, in the village actually decreases uh, the, 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 the higher the female makeup in the, in the, in the, in, in the, in, in the village uh, actually decreases precautionary measures and social participation. Um, and, we were w and we were wondering why. So w what we did was we, we basically supplemented that with the, n the percentage of females with tertiary education as well, which in these areas, there are not many. Yeah? And so not a, lot of, uh, not a lot of females actually had college education. Um, and we found that um, even though having a lot of female basically decreases um, the, the probability that you would undertake precautionary measures, having a lot of females with um, really high education, some college education, actually increases the probability. Right. And, and if you see the probabilities, they basically cancel uh, the, the, this, the, the, the percentage of females with tertiary education with, with regard to the probability level, the magnitude is actually higher. Right, so uh, that's something that we think we could actually live with in, in, in terms of um, the interpretation of the results. Um, and then we also did the joint probability. So, um, so um, we did, there were 16 combina possible combinations altogether. Right, so um, um, so we, we, we ran the predict, we, we actually came up with the predicted probabilities of these 16 um, possible combinations because we're, because as I was referring to earlier on, we did multivariate probit. With multivariate probit, unlike univariate probit, right, we, were, we would be able, uh, we were able to actually find out the joint, um, probability, um, the joint probability distribution, in which case we would actually be able to find out joint probabilities. Um, and so we got the predicted values. And we, we found that the predicted values and, sorry, the predicted values and the actual values, they're actually quite close to each other, meaning that the model um, seems to overall provide quite a good fit with, with the data. All right. So having said everything, so I have only responded to the first research question. Yes, so I was only talking about the determinants of social participation and disaster risk reduction behaviors. There's one, um, there's still one other elephant in the room, and how would social capital and disaster risk reduction behaviors are related then? All right, so the, the way we interpreted it, because we're, we're, not, we're, we're, we're not plucking the, the social uh, capital in as one of the explanatory variables in, in the regression, what we do instead is to look at the conditional probability. Yeah, so, so what we did is we actually looked at the conditional probability on social capital being equal to one and the conditional, prob um, the conditional probability on social capital being equal to zero. Um, the interpretation would be, for, let's say for news equals one, for example, what that means is, let's suppose that if, you, uh, if, you, uh, if I take an individual and that individual participates in social events on a regular basis, I would find that the probability that this guy would actually follow the news would be equal to 0 0.66, right? And if I actually take that same person and he does not, and, and assumes that he does not participate 
in social events on a regular basis, right, I would say that this guy would actually have the probability to follow the news of 0 0.401, um, uh, right? Meaning that I condition the, the precautionary measures based on the social capital. And I, and I found out I, it, eventually that, that, so if you look at the last two rows, okay, so the last row, the, 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 uh, this row says this person right, basically takes absolutely no precautionary measure at all. He doesn't listen to news, he doesn't actually form any evacuation plans, he doesn't even want to move, yeah? This, uh, this, this, this type of, uh, this person, actually, um, if he participated in social events, okay, the probability that he would take absolutely no precautionary measure is basically 20.3%. 20, 20 Right, but if he takes, uh, but if he uh, if he doesn't participate in social events at all, the probability would actually r would actually rise up to thirty eight point six percent, meaning that there is actually a pretty clear. Uh, and if you look at the last row, so this is someone who basically does everything, yeah, and and then the probability is higher for someone who participates in social events um, than someone who doesn't participate in social events. So there's definitely a clear pattern here. We can see that if someone participates in social events that person is actually more likely to take precautionary measures than, um, or to, to, take, um, to undertake disaster re uh, risk reduction behaviors than, um, than someone who doesn't actually participate in social events at all. So there's a, there's a positive relationship, and I think the positive relationship through the, um, the conditional probabilities, um, um, it's pretty evident. All right. so, we conclude uh, that social capital is definitely important for disaster responses. Uh, disaster experience is basically one of the key uh, determinants of social capital and disaster risk reduction behavior. So the implication would be that if you actually want someone to undertake precautionary measures um, um, with regard to disasters, obviously you should encourage social participation and that's basically an indirect way of, of of um, of increasing the probability that someone would actually do something um, to prepare for the disasters. The future research avenues, obviously. So we think that um, maybe we we probably want to look at social capital and inertia in migration a little bit as well. If you think of migration as as a response, it's possible that if someone invests or has invested a lot into the uh, into the social capital in the community already, um, that person may be. A, Unlikely, I was I was thinking of a hypothesis to test. Actually, I was I was thinking that that person may be unlikely to move away from the community, because he has invested so much already. Yeah, so there there might be some sort of inertia. The, so the cost of actually moving away would basically outweigh the benefits. Um, and we were try we're thinking of exploring alternative modeling techniques as well, and uh, maybe try um, a different data set. Right. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nabon. Um, I think I heard a convergence there between sociological insights and economic insights, so I'm very happy about that. <laughs> we only have a few minutes left for uh, discussion, <laughs> five or six minutes, but do people have any questions or comments? Susanna. Um, working? Okay. Uh, so the, the question I have is the term of the three behaviors or the three variables that you're measuring about listening to the news, about being prepared for a disaster, and being moving away. When you say moving away, is having an evacuation behavior or just moving away for good? Because I think that that's very different and there is a qualitative jump between being prepared to move if necessary to a shelter, for example, and being prepared to leave everything. I think that there's something in the middle between those two. Mm. Thank you. I, I think the question uh, basically asked the latter the latter um, question actually me meaning that the, the, it asked whether or not you actually want to move away from the village for good yeah but but uh, so but but that's a great point actually I think we actually need to highlight that in the paper uh, more more questions comments Charles could uh, the importance of uh, your, your finding of participation in social events, can you be very specific what types of social events and whether it is a 
active type of participation or a passive type? Uh, and unfortunately, the questionnaire doesn't really distinguish between active versus passive um, social participation. So, so we do not know. But I. But there's actually an, another conclusion with regard to your question. There's there's another conclusion that I was I was hoping to put in the in the paper, but Raya disagree. So but so so, um, so and she edited all my writing. Um, all right. But so basically, what I was I was what I was hoping to to in, um, include as as an implication would be that. Uh, because because it's it shows in the regression that someone with um, bad disaster experience actually takes um, more precautionary measures and it shows in the re regression that social capital or social participation increases the likelihood that someone would do something to prepare for the disaster. I was hoping that I would actually be able to combine the two a little bit. What, uh, in a setting such as Thailand, um, there, are always, there are a lot of community um, gatherings in the village, especially at the village level. People know each other all the time. Uh, well, and, and they talk to each other all the time as well. So m maybe, I w because um, I, 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 was, I was thinking that maybe, would it be a stretch to think that um, one of the implications of work would be um, for the government to provide a forum for someone with past disaster experience um, um, to actually be able to talk to other people who haven't had a bad disaster experience before in order for them to realize the gravity of the situation, in which case they may be more likely to actually take precautionary measures. She took it out, um, but may because probably, <laughs> or maybe you uh, unintentionally did, but, um, but, but um, I don't know. I mean, uh, yes, please, uh, Patrick. <laughs> uh, my question is related to uh, some of your results and your findings on the, um, especially at the village level, with the proportion of women mm -hmm. and uh, uh, the um, presence of uh, uh, higher educated women. In this survey that you collected, don't you have any indicators that you can use? to have a better understanding of uh, the women autonomy and women uh, uh, empowerment uh, in, in traditional Thai society mm -hmm. that you are looking at. It's, I'm not familiar enough with the region to, to know uh, to what extent women are decision makers, to what, to what extent women are in position to make decisions about a lot of those issues or mm -hmm. it's pretty much left, either left or the men keep these uh, 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 responsibilities or authorities and women are not in position to make uh, or have access to either information or decisions. Okay. Uh, if you have any indicators uh, to get a better sense of this, it would be probably helpful somewhere in your analysis to take it that into account. The other thing I'm a little bit concerned is you don't have a very huge sample. You have about 600 observations, if That's I see correct. somewhere in your yes. analysis. And you have a lot of variables uh, in your analysis. So some of the effects that you are trying to catch, n I'm afraid they might be diluted a little bit by just breaking right. down the data into many, many subsets. Right, I, 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 I agree, yeah. That, and, um, uh, yeah, when, when we, when, um, uh, Y you're right. Um, um, we, we're the, the, the I, I guess one, all right, let, let, let me re respond to the first question first, which is basically an easier <laughs> question to answer. With, with regard to autonomy, uh, we, we don't actually have a particular question that asks about autonomy. We don't know who's a decision maker in, in, uh, in, in a particular household. Um, but. Uh, we actually tried a specification where we looked at, uh, we, we basically split the sample into um, households where the female, uh, the head of the household is a female, and we, we uh, with how versus household where the head of the household is basically a male. Um, and we found that there, there's actually, uh, there's not a lot of difference between the two. But you, you're right, it's, there's a possibility also that the coefficients are actually quite biased in the sense that the sample is really small, especially considering that you, once you split the sample, it, it becomes even smaller, the subsamples. 
Good, thank you very much. We should um, close this part now and move on to the next paper, but uh, please join me in thanking Napapon right, for thank a very you. stimulating paper. Uh, the next paper is by Tanya Pon, Chang Krajang, uh, and Raya. Um, while uh, Tanya Pon's coming up here, um, I should mention that all the papers in this session uh, are part of the ERC grant on forecasting society's adaptive capacity, which is the, the large grant led by Wolfgang. So this is a second paper in the sequence. And, uh, thank you. Are you ready? Thank you. Hi. Um, I'm just too glad that I don't have to present it after the video. <laughs> okay, so <laughs> otherwise I would be in good spirit. So um, this is a co-paper with um, Raya, and you may realize that it's one of her many papers in this seminar. And the title is um, Who is Concerned and Does Something About Climate Change? gender and education divide among Thais. So basically, um, if you still remember um, what Wolfgang has introduced us about um, the effect of education on um, vulnerability um, about climate change yesterday, um, so um, you may it's, it's maybe easier to, to grab the conceptual uh, motivation about this paper. So basically, uh, it's based on the same line of conceptual ideas, so why we think education can be important. Um, but we shift um, the focus a little bit from um, looking at vulnerability to look at worries or concerns about climate change and look at um, the behaviors that people uh, adopt and the behaviors that we normally think that is environmentally friendly. So I think I can save some time um, and skip directly to um, data and analysis. Okay, but if you have questions about the conceptual motivation, we can come back to that um, during the question session, okay? Good. So um, let me recap a little bit. So we have two main questions. The first one is whether gender and education affects um, the concerns and worries about climate change. And the second one, whether gender and education can have an impact on the, um, the way that people adopt behaviors, environmentally friendly behavior. Okay, so we've got the data from um, the survey on opinions about um, environment and global warming in 2010. It is done by the National Statistical Office of Thailand and it covers um, quite a big range of information about global warming related. Uh, but we are uh, going to look at um, some of the, the variables here in this paper just to be more focused. And it also covers basic demographic and a little bit on socio-economic um, characteristics. And um, the way, a little bit of the background of the survey, it is done by three um, level um, stage um, stratification, like going pick up um, the block of village and then going to the household and then household member. Okay, and we have um, 3,900 um, adults in this um, um, survey, okay, and there's no missing information. So let's have a quick look at the descriptive statistics. So the variables, um, the first one that we are interested in is about the concern about global warming. And um, unfortunately, um, it's very hard to have continuous variable um, on this um, measure. So um, in the questionnaire, people have to tick like um, um, whether they concern a great deal about global warming or a fair amount, little or not at all. But because little and not at all are so small as a fraction, so we combine it together um, in the analysis, okay? And then, uh, let me go to this first. And we have um, 11 um, behaviors that can be associated to um, kind of um, climate friendly um, behaviors. And um, in the end, we did decide to drop three of the variables. We dropped um, whether you set up the air condition at um, 25 degrees Celsius and whether you use um, public transport instead of um, driving yourself and whether you plant trees. Um, the reasons being is that um, these behaviors depend um, very much on the context um, 
of um, your own characteristics, like whether you really have the air conditioner or whether you own the car so that you can have the decision whether you do drive it or not, or whether you live um, very close by the forest or um, having activities to do with the trees. Okay, so we decide to drop that, and that kind of confirmed with the um, principal component analysis. Um, I'm talking about it later on as well. So basically, we are left with um, um, these variables, and we actually group them into two types. Okay, so the first one, um, we called it um, technical and behavioral change. Okay, so this one, we um, our intuition, guys, at this that um, it should require more um, understanding and knowledge about what to do to be proactive or reactive about um, in, uh, global warming. But the second one, electricity and water saving, it's, it's more like um, you may do it not because um, of the environmental reason, but m maybe you want to save some cost. Okay, and so the first group um, we have um, whether you use um, use cloth bags um, regularly or sometimes or never. Um, you use energy saving bulbs, um, energy efficient appliances, or you reduce the use of styrofoam um, container. So if you look at the distribution of um, regularly, sometimes never. So um, they are fairly um, evenly distributed. I mean, not really evenly, but if you compare to the second type, then you can see the difference in the distribution. So the second type comprises of um, whether you unplug the electrical devices when you don't use it, you turn off um, unused lights, turn off the tap, um, fill in container when washing. Okay, so if you look at them, um, actually people, um, most of the people do it quite regularly. Okay, so for, for this um, electricity and water saving. Okay, and apart from um, using our intuition or conceptual idea to divide them into two groups, Raya has done, oops, not this one. Raya has done um, wonderful um, analysis using principal component analysis to to just to confirm our intuition by statistical method that these two groups are mostly orthogonal to each other, meaning that um, you can really separate them into two groups, and within the groups, um, they can explain um, the they have most common variation in terms of explaining the variation in the data. Okay, so we we can we can actually organize our thought like into um, these types. Okay. And we also have individual characteristics, age groups, um, highest level of education. But um, for highest level of education, we can also create another variable about education, which is years of education, so to calculate back from, from the um, category, so that we can have more informative measure of education instead of like being types of education. And then we have climate change perceptions uh, to to make it a control variable that like um, conditioning on this, um, how is your behavior would be. And then we have contextual um, characteristics only at the region level because the National Statistical Office refused to release the information on province or district. Maybe I wasn't so persuasive in asking for that data, so they, they refused. Okay, and we, we also calculated um, other variables using other um, surveys um, to match up about um, the average level of education in that region and average mon monthly wage by the level of education. Okay, all right. So let's have a look at the empirical strategy. So um, if you realize our independent variables are not continuous, um, they are in categories. So either you report like never or sometimes or regularly. So we are doing um, ordinal, um, ordinal response model. So basically um, your concerns or um, behavior depends on gender, education, and when we also control um, by wage, um, climate change experience, and other characteristics, okay? And since we don't really observe the Y as in um, continuum of numbers, so we just only observe it uh, like very low level, middle level, high level, if we assume that it uh, 
um, has some threshold in the in the model. Okay. And this is the baseline um, empirical strategy. We also have the another um, strategy, which is um, instrumental variable strategy. So why is this important in our analysis? Because our main focus is on the impact of education. But education is so notorious variable that it is actually um, related to many unobservable characteristics. For example, um, ability or your value, okay, we will be fine if those um, characteristics like ability that we don't observe have has nothing to do with our Y variable, what we are interested in, like concerns or behaviors that we choose. But actually, we can think of the way that ability or um, value can also influence um, the behaviors that you take or influence your concerns, okay? So in that case, we land into some problem because um, ability, unobservable characteristic um, determines both education and our concern or behavior at the same time. So if you just do the baseline result, the, um, the estimated impact of education would be inconsistent and biased because um, it also captures other effects as well. It will capture the effect of ability inside it as well. It will capture the effect of um, uh, value inside it as well. So we just want to have um, a little bit more confidence about saying about the, the impact of education than using the baseline strategy, okay? Now, so, so we are going to use the instrumental um, variable strategy. So we have to find a variable that actually can have an impact on education, but it's independent of like concerns or the process that generates concerns or um, behaviors, okay? Luckily, in Thailand, we have this um, compulsory educational reform, okay? Um, which is, we think that is exogenously imposed by the government. It, 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 it was um, it exogenously imposed by the government uh, in 1977. So the government has implemented six years of compulsory education. Okay, although it's a six years of compulsory education, um, we assume that it can have um, the effect on the probability of people going to even higher education. So what we do, we will explore this cohort exogenous variation as our IV, I'll talk about it later, and then regional exogenous variation. So there is um, ex um, variation in um, among different regions about um, spending on education as well. And I, we think that this is exogenous because it's determined by parental decision and it's at regional average. So, so individual cannot have impact on that. And then we use the interaction between these two variables to create the third, dummy, third IV as well. So basically, for the reform variable. So if the people um, were born, like if the age in the cohort is greater than 50, so they were born before the reform, okay? So the impact of the reform would be no effect. So I assi we assign um, value zero. And if you are aged between 40 to 49, so you were already born by the time of the reform but um, you, you're still in school at that time, so you could be partially affected by the reform. So I roughly assign um, a half for the reform variable. And then if you were born after the reform, you will be fully affected by the reform, so that is one, okay? So basically, we will estimate education first by these exogenous variables, and then we will use this predicted education to plug back into our like baseline strategy, okay? So basically, um, so we have also, here it shows that our IVs, these variables, explain education very well. Okay, so if you were born after the reform, you're more likely to, to, be, um, to have more years spent in education. And education expenditure can be, be viewed as the cost, so that's why it's negative. But when you, you interact it with education, uh, with the reform, it's positive. And here it, the cutoff is 0.3, so it means that um, for the generation after the reform, actually if the household spend more on education, the chances are 
um, you're more likely to have higher education. Okay, so that's about the, the first stage. Now, okay, all right, so we're going to the empirical results now. So um, about the concerns about global warming, so here's the baseline result that we use. Um, we don't use the IV here. And we do um, education as in category. So you can see that compared to the reference um, level, which is upper secondary, for those who, so let's have a look at the last model. For those who have lower level of education, we'll be less likely to, con to be concerned um, about environment, um, global warming. But if you have higher education, especially bachelor degree and above you, you're more likely to be more concerned. And Okay, and this is matched up by, by when we use years spent in education. You, the high, the additional years of education actually um, do you, if you have more and more year, you have more um, concern. And for the IV, so IV still confirm our baseline result. Okay, so um, the coefficient is still positive and statistically significant. But um, so let's let um, about the interpretation. Um, so it means that um, for education, if you have for the IV result, if you have um, so the odds that you will be uh, having greater concern about global warming is 1.3, 1.03 for an additional year of education. For women, it's 1.1 times that of men. Okay, but. If we compare the IV result with the baseline result, we see that the IV result is actually smaller, the coefficient is smaller. So it means that our hypothesis is that um, the, the education may capture ability or um, value actually is captured in the data. So IV is actually smaller when, when you do that, okay? And then about behaviors, so the first, um, baseline result when we group um, behavior into two groups um, using principal component analysis. Um, very interesting um, about um, technical and behavioral change, education has positive effect. But for electric and water saving, education doesn't have any statistical impact about that. So let's have a look at um, the more um, detailed result. Um, so if I disaggregate it, so this is um, technical and behavioral change using bags and styrofoam appliances and bulbs. Using the IV, it kind of still confirms the result we saw in the baseline that um, years spent in education is positively um, correlated with adopting this um, technical um, and um, that requires some, some background knowledge. Um, to adopt this um, behavior. But when we turn into um, electricity and water saving, it's actually, I, I was so shocked <laughs> when, when I first got, got the, the um, result because for years when in education is negative and statistically significant. And for two days, <laughs> I didn't know what to do. <laughs> that. So, so I tried many combinations and finally, I. We remember something that that exists um, years spent in education square. Okay, so I squared years spent in education, and the result is like positive and statistically significant. So, what does it mean? Okay, so it means that um, the behavior, um, electricity and water saving behavior is no longer a monotonic a monotonic function of education. It actually have a invert, no, U shape like this, okay? So, so I want to find the turning point, like with, with exact years of education that people like turn um, their behavior upwards, okay? So we do back of the envelope calculation. So I calculate the marginal effect of um, behavior on a regular basis because that's where most people um, answer um, the question and it in, is in line with other um, type of behavior. And then it turns out that the turning point is around nine years on, aver on average. Okay, so um, for the first nine years of education. So 
an additional year of education actually um, decreases the probability of you taking um, water and electricity saving on a, a regular basis. But after that, after that nine years, okay, one more year of education actually increases the probability of taking that behavior. And nine years of education in Thailand is actually um, after the lower secondary education. So that's Okay, okay, okay. So I can conclude. So we have consistent findings with previous studies, but where is our contributions come in is that um, we actually show that different types of um, behaviors can be affected differently by by education and gender. I forgot to mention that gender matters for um, technical um, behavior, but not for saving behavior. Um, women tend to take more action. And then um, we can, because of um, the principal components analysis, we can um, disaggregate it into two groups of um, behavior. And we can say with fair, a fair level of confidence that um, with the IV strategy that education can have um, some effect in concerns and behaviors. Thank you. Thank you. Good. We, we have 10 minutes for discussion. Uh, we would like to lead the way. Uh, Susanna? Uh, so I have a quick question. Maybe I, I miss a part, but do you have any way of see if there is an, an interaction, or maybe it's already it assumed that there is an interaction between education level and income? Education income. I, I haven't tried it, to be honest, and I should try it, OK. But um, actually, um, the level of income that we have here is not directly from the survey, because they didn't ask this question. So what we did we constructed wage from other um, survey, and that is um, at the regional level because we, we can cannot match back to the individual. And the wage that I used we used is actually um, by educational level because I just want to control that um, education doesn't have an effect through wage and then through um, to the concerns again. So I can try that, but. But I think the nature of variable might create some problem, but surely, yeah, it's a good suggestion. Thank you. John Wei. Thank you. Uh, I just want to make a, a general comment. Uh, more than 30 years ago, when Richard Easterlin developed a model analyzing fertility regulation behavior. Uh, he mentioned three important variables. One is demand for children, second, the supply of the children, and the third one is the cost of fertility regulation. I think probably that's also important for our analysis of energy saving behavior or environmental protection behavior. And uh, because the cost of such a behavior is extremely important, uh, both for the society and for household for individual. Because by nature, our society is driven by economic benefit, or largely by economic benefit. Even academics, where our research is driven by money by research funding. Uh, when we look at the people's behavior, it's the same. Uh, I think your talk partly already touched upon that issue, because when they, you talk about uh, the, the U-shaped relationship between education, water saving, and energy saving, uh, of course, I, I, I strongly believe education is extremely important. But on the other hand, we also have that kind of paradoxical situation. On the one hand, you find the people with better education, they're more aware of the fact we need to do something about the environmental protect, uh, protection, about saving energy. But on the other hand, you also find people with better education, including all sitting in this room, we consume 
we consume more energy, we contribute to more carbon emission than those poor farmers. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah, I think that's, that's a very kind of more in-depth um, comments. And the only thing that I can answer back is that um, we maybe um, I didn't mention that we, co um, we control for average wage by education as well. And it actually um, matters for um, saving um, electricity and water savings here, okay, but it's negatively correlated, so maybe, yeah, yeah, it's... Hmm. But there are also an issue of your relative income. With right? ed yes, because for me, if I have a four-bedroom flat, probably I only need to use 20% of my salary to pay it. Mm -hmm. Okay, but for other people, they may have to use 60% of their salary to pay that room, that house. Yeah, thank you, but we don't have information about cost. Yeah. Uh, anyone else? Yes. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Uh, please, Mr. Just a very short uh, uh, comment. Uh, by trying to analyze this nonlinearity in education using a square, you are assuming that the changes prior to the turning point and after the turning point are symmetric. Yeah, yeah, that's. You could very easily just use a piecewise linear function, just a threshold saying up to a certain level you have an increase and then you have a decrease. Um, assuming that those slopes may or may not be the same. And you could get an estimate of the turning point which is significantly different from the one you have right now, uh, just by uh, allowing both slopes before the turning point and after the turning point to differ from each okay, other. Yeah, and you could also check whether they are the same or not. Okay, thank you so much. Yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll talk to we'll you later. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Yeah. It's not on, yeah. Sorry. I just have a quick comment. Uh, you show some very interesting results for Thailand, but uh, I think that it would be interesting as a sort of robustness check to uh, check also with data from the World Value Survey because it has very similar questions and you wouldn't be able to do all the instrumental variable analysis, but just to see if the patterns are similar across countries or if there are different groups of countries yeah. that have different, but different types of patterns, because they're very similar questions, but for lots of countries okay. across the world. Thank you so much, Ed. Okay. Thank you. Uh, just follow up on some of the comments made by Susanna and, and Song Wei. Um, it is indeed uh, the case that the relationship between education and income with respect to resource use is, is very complex. In, in research consumption, there is a, this famous rebound effect that you find in many places when you successfully implement uh, energy savings measures uh, that actually are good for people because they save money. They then use this saved money to consume more energy or consume other things. So you make progress in energy saving, but uh, the additional income uh, allows people to do other uh, spending, which is again because our economy simply has not yet uh, sort of um, disentangled uh, the economic growth uh, from um, energy consumption. And uh, the same is, of course, in, uh, in ed with education, when education is associated with, or you may argue even is a driver of people coming out of poverty. Of course, they consume more everywhere when people uh, come out of poverty, they uh, consume more energy. And the interesting point is really the, the, the point of discussion that, that you made, and, and here's the where is the turning point? There seems to be in many surveys in many countries a clear indication that after a certain degree, uh, one's uh, sort of additional education uh, even if it's associated with additional income, does not lead uh, to more energy consumption because then there is some sort of a cognitive process that makes you uh, change your behavior. You can see this in European cities when there's the choice of using public transportation instead of your own car, that this is a, a transition made much more easily by the highly educated, even uh, at the same level of income.
Wolfgang, while you have the microphone, <laughs> would you say that all that uh, there is a sort of balance here between self-interested behavior and altruistic behavior? Well, um, that's a good question whether being for sort of uh, conscious of the environment is altruistic behavior. It may also be a, just a wise and longer term self-interest. <laughs> We have time for one more question, if someone has something they want to add. Please, yes. Yeah. Uh, uh, one of the, <coughs> uh, the environmental variables that you have taken, uh, one of the variable was that whether you have felt climate change compared to the last year. Uh, yeah, yeah. Can you, <coughs> is it, uh, my, my, my uh, query related to this is that is it, is it safe to say that uh, climate change with respect to last year because climate change last year, how can anybody see climate change compared to last year because it's uh, about 30 to 40 years experience to have conclusively say that there is climate change or not. Okay, uh, so. Uh, so and, and following this, a second question is that you have uh, used uh, uh, use of energy saving bulbs in your in, in that uh, uh, and another another one was that uh, whether you turn off your lights or not so my question is that you have said that those are related to I mean people are I environmentally concerned or not I mean do, don't you think that these two are overlapping because this is part of one is part of the another one yeah thank you very much okay so the first question um, about um um, global, I'm um, sorry, climate change um, experience. So uh, perhaps I wasn't clear, it, it was my fault. Um, the fact is um, what we have in the survey is that um, people were asked whether you, um, is their opinion, their perception, that um, whether they thought that they had environmental problem in community. So it's like subjective to your perception. Okay, it may be right, it may be wrong. So so we we make it as a control variable so that um, just like, so for control for how you think about the climate change and then how, how you react to that. And for the second point, yeah, we had some troubles thinking about like how to organize them into groups uh, and actually you actually mentioned some of my uneasiness about. Um, so for Bob's, okay, so can you see that although the principal component analysis um, put um, it together in um, technical behavioral change and uh, so we decided to put it in this type, but the result is actually different from other variables. So it's actually more in line with uh, electricity and water saving. So yeah, we still decided like, yeah, what to do about this. So, so it's one of my yeah, uneasiness about the result. Okay, thank you, yes, to mention that. Thank you very much, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. So um, you have listened to our work on disaster preparedness. Um, you have seen our work on um, concern about climate change and sort of environmental, environmentally friendly behavior. So now you're moving on to um, adaptation, or to, to be precise, adaptation intention. And this is a joint work with Wolfgang and um, our co-author from the College of Population Studies, Virapon Potisri, who, who is not present here. Um, so I, I try to be quick because we have spent so many times on the previous two paper. Um, so we have heard throughout this conference that um, about the recent, the most recent report from the IPCC Working Group 2 um, that they have found evidence that the impacts of global warming are likely to be severe, pervasive, and irreversible. And the very last point that the impact of global warming is likely to be irreversible is quite alarming because that means that we have to cope with or adapt to the increasing or, or the rising um, global temperature. So we have to adapt to that. But um, there are limits and barriers to adaptation. So there are things that we can do and there are sort of physical and ecological limit that it's beyond our um, capacity to adapt things like rapid sea level rise or loss of Arctic sea ice. Um, and there are sort of softer 
um, barriers to adaptation, um, factors like knowledge, for example. A person might want to adapt to the changing climate, but he or she doesn't know what to do. Or there are technological and financial constraints. And there are social barriers, such as a person doesn't have access to information, a person doesn't understand the information, or some cultural barriers. There are some um, communities, uh, some Muslim countries do not encourage women to learn how to swim, for example. So that's a those sort of cultural barriers to adaptation. So as adaptation is a process, so for adaptation action to take place, a person needs to have an intention to adapt. And there are sort of two different um, dimensions that determine intention to adapt. One dimension is the perception of risk and adaptive capacity, which can be further divided into objective one and um, subjective one. So objective um, adaptive capacity, it's something like um, your ability to, to adapt. Do you have access to resources or not? Do you have, uh, do the is the resource available or not? So let's say a person who lives in a flood prone area might want to elevate their house up, maybe two meters higher up, but he or she simply doesn't have um, the money to do so. So that's a kind of objective adaptive capacity. And there's a subjective one, so it's a perception that's a person perceived of what he or she can do with the evaluation, evaluation of the cost of doing so. And there are certain factors that determine risk perception and adaptive capacity, things like um, demographic, socioeconomic socio characteristics, um, experience of previous disaster, and exposure to the risk. So. In this paper, we asked a very simple question. So what are the factors that determine um, adaptation intention? The data th that we use is the household survey um, of provincially representative samples in the three provinces in Thailand. Um, I'm going to talk about, I'm gonna, the next slide, uh, I am going to show you why we chose these three provinces, Panga, Kalasin, and Ayutthaya. And this is a survey that we conducted uh, last year jointly between the Wittgenstein Center and the CPS. Um, the survey was a face-to-face -face interview of an adult member aged 15 years and over for, from each household, so one person um, per household. And we achieved a sample of 1,310. We uh, managed to have quite a balanced um, um, proportion between female respondents and male respondents. Because it's it's more difficult to find a man who would stay home for you to interview. So we we did our best to, to get the male respondents. And um, we have in quite detailed information about individual demographic and socioeconomic characteristics, as well as the characteristic of all household members. Um, and since the survey is designed to capture many dimensions of disaster experience and climate change, so we have quite an extensive um, um, indicators of climate related information, things like awareness and knowledge of climate change, perception of climate risk and adaptation responses, disaster preparedness, um, the experience and the, and the impacts of disaster, like loss and damage in terms of uh, properties, and coping stra strategies to, to such loss. So these are the three provinces that we chose for our case studies. So all these three provinces um, have a variation in the type of risk that uh, the area um, face. For Panga, as you have seen already, the biggest um, damage that Panga experienced was the tsunami. Ayutthaya is located in the central part of Thailand. Um, it's 80 kilometers north of Bangkok. and uh, it is uh, in a lower flood plain area, so it suffers frequently flood. You might have heard about 2011 big flood in Thailand. That was uh, the biggest flood in 20 years time. And UTI suffered the highest monetary loss compared to the rest um, 60 provinces in Thailand. Kalasin, yesterday you have heard the uh, presentation of Jacqueline about the area in the northeastern part of Thailand. It's a dry area, it's a drought prone area, but we chose Kalasin because it, not only because of 
the risk of drought, but calisthenics was also affected, frequently affected by flood and sometimes cold wave. And I, I think you experience how hot it is. So when we have the cold wave, that's, that's quite something here. <laughs> um, so the outcome variable that we look at, um, I call it the housing reconstruction intention of the disaster. If you have better terms, please let me know. But um, so this dependent variable is derived from a question which we ask, if your house were to be destroyed by a natural hazard and you do not have any financial constraints, what would you do? So we sort of gave a condition of no financial constraints because we want to s kind of take out the objective adaptive capacity side. So a person have to think that he or she have a lot of money, no financial concern, what would they do? And we gave our four possible answers. The first one was rebuilding the house in the same place using the same materials. The second one, rebuilding the house in the same place but using stronger materials. The third one is rebuilding the house within the same community or the same village but we move to low risk area. And the third one is moving to another place far away from the community. Um, and as I said, that we're interested in the factors that determine the answer to such questions. So we look at individual characteristics, household characteristics, and village characteristics. Um, so demographic characteristics, and we have the measurement of uh, cognition, um, which something that we try to tap the the understanding of the message or the sort of how people interpret. So we have two indicators. One is climate change knowledge and another one is more of the general cognition. It's a quite standard um, cognitive ability test, which is a number of words we call. So we read out 10 words and um, people have to repeat how many words that they, they can remember. And we have two indicators of risk perceptions. We ask the likelihood that a person think that natural disaster could happen in their community in the next five years. And also we ask whether a person or the household um, were affected by climate change. And we also have a series of uh, information about disaster experience, but I sort of capture it in, in two um, forms. One is home and property the person has, ex or the house who has experienced home and property damage, and the second one is the damage to livelihoods. So damage to livelihoods could be um, that rice field was destroyed, or in case of fishermen, probably the fishing boat were destroyed, something like that. Um, and they have a series of household characteristics. Um, we know that the wealth of the household measured by household income, home ownership, land ownership, we know the building materials of the house, whether the house was built, um, whether the house is concrete or wooden house or half concrete or half wood. Um, we know the length of residency, we know the ge geographical location of the house and I have a series of household demographic composition. I also have a lot of village characteristic um, information but I haven't got time to, to use that yet. Um, since the outcome, we have po four possible outcomes of rebuilding the house, and they're not ordinal, so I cannot order which one is better than what. So um, the straightforward uh, type of estimation that one should use for such a nominal outcome is multinomial logic. And the base outcome, so we're comparing people who um, would use stronger material or people who said that they would move with the people who said that we would build a house in the same place and we would use the same material. And um, because that could be the variation between villages um, in the answer to the, to the question. So the, the right model to use is multi-level analysis. So we have um, our respondents uh, randomly scatter around 31 villages in the three provinces. So the estimation method that we used was the multi-level, multinomial logic. Um, if the economists want to know the village random intercept, it's your fixed effect. <laughs> um, so here I'm showing you the distribution of the answer to the housing reconstruction intention by gender. So basically, if you look at this bivariate relationship, there's no um, significant difference between gender in the responding to, to, to these questions. 
the majority of people um, said that they would use stronger materials, so 70% of them. About 10% said that they would just build a house in the same place, they would use the same material. So these are the people who sort of, one could say that they would do nothing. Um, about 10% said that they would move, but move in the same community, and about sort of 9% said that they would move, move to another region. And if I sort of zoom in, focusing on the people who said that they would move, move in the same community or move um, into another region by age, gender, and education, so you sort of see the, the patterns between the, the three um, demographic um, factors. If you look at the, um, so if you look at the difference between education groups, so these two lines are the, the those with lower education, so these two lines are those with higher um, education, so those with at least upper secondary level, so they are um, more likely to say that they would move, and we see also a bit of age effects here, so those who are um, the older one are less likely to say that they would move, and there's some slight gender difference here, but, but that's not statistically significant here. Then um, here I'm showing you the answer to the question by the perception of the likelihood of the disaster in the community in the next five years. Um, so the relationship is not linear, but if you look at the, um, the, the red line here, which is those who say that they would use the same material. So if they think that there would be no risk in this community, so they're more likely to say that I would just use the same material. And if you look at the violet line, um, which represent those who say that they would move and move to another region, that we observe a kind of a linear relationship slightly. And here is the result, it's the odds. Um, I represent the, the coefficient in terms of odds. Um, of the housing reconstruction intention and the base category is using the same material. So the demographic characteristic that we observed earlier, the age, women, and education, um, once we control for heterogeneity between villages and also other different factors, so we don't see anymore the relationships between demographic characteristics and um, the answer to, 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 to this question. But if you look at the, our cognition measurement, right here, um, which the two measurements are also correlated, the number of words recall and the knowledge on climate change. So they are positively correlated with the likelihood of saying that they would use stronger materials, they would move it in the community, they would move to another region. And these three um, cognition measurement, this, these two cognition measurements are also positive related to education. So it could be that um, the effect of the main effect of education was sort of mediated through the effect of, uh, of, of cognition. And um, another major drive of the, of the answer to the housing reconstruction intention is the perception of, of the likelihood of disaster in the community in the next five years. It's not quite linear, but if compared to those who say that there would be no risk at all in our community. Those who think that there would be some risk, then they are more likely to say that they would use stronger materials or they're more likely to say that they would move. Um, the um, relationship with experienced is sort of in the expected direction. So those who, who experience because they know what it is, right? So those who experience home and property damage um, in the past, then they're more likely to say that I would do something um, for our house, and I could sort of skip that, but um, so it's sort of in the expected direction. So those compared with those who rent a house, those who own a house without a mortgage, then they're less likely to say that they would move. And there's some variation between provinces, and the variance there represents the heterogeneity between villages. So it's sort of confirmed that the answer to this question depends also on which village you live in. So I already talked through that, but just one thing to bear, bear in mind is this type of question is sensitive to the subjective interpretation of the question. Because we went to the house of the person, their beautiful house, and asked, what would you do if your house were to be destroyed? So 
that is something that, that we can't tap in any of the variables that we have. It's sort of, it depends on the imagination and I think probably demographic characteristics couldn't, might not be able to explain even how people would I could imagine such a hypothetical question. What we can tap is psychological perception of risk and the past experience. So the next step, um, I might have, we might have to step backward a little bit to look at the demographic differences and other factors that determine the risk perception. So one could think about the kind of the structural model or the two um, uh, steps. So the first one is what are the factors that determine risk perception and then the second one or simultaneously think about what are the factors that determine adaptation intention and I could as well add in the village level characteristics that I have. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Raya. We have uh, 10 minutes or so for questions. Susanna and then Mark. Uh, thank you. That, that was uh, a very, very interesting paper uh, with a very prerogative question. I think that kind of a, almost experimental you want. But I just have a question, and I don't know if it's just included in some of the other variables that you already have, but it's related to occupation. You have three different settings, and I imagine that what people do for a living, it could be quite different. Uh, but you have a question about damage to livelihoods, and I don't know, maybe it's captured there. But do you have a, cap a question about occupation? how closely related the occupation is to the use of uh, resources or to the environment. Um, and also, if that is possible to know at the household level, how diverse the different uh, occupations are among the members. Thank you for the question. Um, I, I have all the information that you asked for, both the individual occupation and um, household level of every member in the household, so I could do I think I did that, but I didn't show it, but they are correlated. Yeah. Exactly, yeah. Thank you. I'm, I'm very interested in um, your experiences in this survey and gathering information about um, past experience on the part of the household or the interviewee with mm -hmm. disasters of different kinds or hazard events of different kinds. So. Uh, how detailed were you able uh, uh, to be in those sorts of questions? You know, in demography, we collect these days without thinking very detailed birth histories. So you can imagine going back in time a certain number of months or years and trying to do something analogous in collecting experience of drought, of flood, of, uh, you know, any number of but how, how ambitious were you in this, in this respect? Um, we limited to the disaster experience in the past three years. So there was discussion amongst us as well. Like, so we hope in the three year um, gap, a person could recall something. But then the tsunami was an exception. So apart from this three year experience, we asked also about, particularly about tsunami experience. Thank you. Um, if you also asked uh, how long the family had already been living in this house or in this place, because I could imagine that that also matters. If this is a very old house, our family has been living here for generations and generations. It makes a difference uh, to when they've only been living there for one generation or so. Yes, um, it was in the, the previous model, but basically the, the longer they live, they are less likely to say that they would move. And this is correlated with also if the family owns a house or not. So this kind of, so so this the length of residency effect disappear, but but it it's there, yeah. So it's a own, owning house sort of have stronger effect that kills away the length of rated residency. Um, this is a very interesting paper, and this. Like uh, for the first time, we see that demographic uh, uh, characteristics uh, 
don't play a role. <laughs> this uh, for the whole um, uh, workshop. This is the first uh, conclusion we, we can have, and I'm very curious about this kind of uh, you know you you mentioned this uh, the cognitive uh, um, skills, and uh, I noticed that I use a um, variable here, um, words recall. That's that's something you know I think very interesting and. It depends on also on the characteristics of the of the person you talk to, and also depends on the uh, the interviewer, right? How you interact with a uh, um, because it's a kind of scenario building um, by both uh, the interviewee and the interviewer. So you are kind of uh, you know um, you both construct a kind of a uh, imagined vision <laughs> uh, uh, to the future. So I don't know if this, uh, you know, the, 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 um, you, 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 you participated in the, in the survey, or what exactly you, um, this kind of words recall means. Yes, actually, Tadan on board, Hong, he, he was helping me with the interview. He could answer to this question. But we, um, we agree among the interviewers. We had um, 10 interviewers, and in different regions, we also train students, university students from other areas to help. But we agree that we built the same scenario. So a person has to imagine that there would be a flood, a big flood that covered the whole house, and it got completely destroyed. So we we try to build that now. <laughs> I, I, I think that's, that's in effect in that definitely because we what we can control or ask is the interview where you have to build that situation then it depends on how dramatic a person could explain the situation. It might help in the, in the future with Photos, for example, that that could be helpful. So, you, the, so pe yeah, I haven't thought about that. <laughs> a question. Uh, uh, this is a uh, very uh, complex, and uh, when you don't find what you expected, uh, now, Raya, you're not an economist; you're a sociologist. So, I want to ask you: Did you do qualitative work? Did you do? focus group, did you discuss uh, all these sensitive issues? I mean, a decision-making process to move or not uh, is uh, almost stochastic, depending on conditional probabilities. So tell us about your qualitative work and how people would arrive at a decision to move or not. Um, I haven't done that yet, but Wolfgang also have an interest to sort of sit down and, and talk to the people, not just go to them and look, we have to finish the survey in 30 minutes. Um, we need more funding to do so. <laughs> that would be my answer. But I, but I, I, I agree with, with your point. Yeah. I, we didn't spend enough time to, to sit down and, and observe. I think that's a brave research question <laughs> yeah, to do. And um, I'm just wondering whether you have um, the variable telling whether the household has someone who has migrated to other places or city so that maybe it's easier for them to move. And that could be demographic um, variable and could be linked to the like, network or social capital as well. Um. Yes, we have this information. I have to analyze that. So we have the information of all the children, of assuming that our respondent is a sort of the head of household or spouse. Then we know, we asked everything about the children, and we asked if the children are not living in the household, where did they go, and why did they go out? Trying to tap in also, the, if, if they went out because of drought reason, but that didn't come up that much. But yeah. We have, and we should use that. Thank you. Araya, could I maybe ask a question or to your whole team? We've been talking about differential vulnerability, and here we're talking about intention for adaptation. And my question is in your experience, bearing in mind the Venn diagram that Wolfgang uh, introduced the seminar where we have the uh, we have hazard, we have exposure, and we have vulnerability, and the overlap is the risk. 
in your experience, does it make sense to view vulnerability there as incorporating adaptive capacity, or should this be another, another circle, so to speak? I'm finding that the discussion, we're talking about vulnerability, and sometimes we mean vulner vulnerability as all of those things that may predispose you to have adverse effects. But the concept of vulnerability is more like a net result. We've got that kind of vul vulnerability narrowly defined, plus the adaptive capacity which counterweights it. <laughs> and so we seem to be in my mind, working with two notions of vulnerability mm -hmm. here. And I wonder whether you've experienced this in designing this research and whether you have any view on that, or maybe Wolfgang? Yeah. <laughs> yes, thank you. There is a lot of uh, terminological confusion in the whole discussion. And uh, the chart I showed at the beginning uh, is from the IPCC report that tried to sort of standardize some of the terminology. And as you rightly observed, uh, this uh, chart does not use the terminology of adaptive capacity there. So the way we interpret it, it, it would be something reducing the vulnerability, strengthening uh, the, the individual or the community uh, in a way to be less vulnerable. Uh, when exposed to a given hazard. Of course, it can also be part of the um, adaptation or the adaptive capacity, sort of looking uh, before for in a yeah, forward-looking way, uh, is uh, to try to avoid the exposure. It is moved to another place. And then you are, of course, at the same time reducing your vulnerability, but also reducing the exposure. Uh, so the adaptive capacity, in a way, can affect both of these right-hand variables. And as you remember on the chart, they are linked to sort of social economic development. Uh, the hazard is an externally given that is not being affected by adaptive capacity. So maybe the Venn diagram should be also a little bit so that in a classic Venn diagram, you have the possibility of an overlap between two of the three things and not the third. But in the IPC, uh, Venn diagram, if you've got overlap between two, by definition, you've got overlap with the third one. So maybe we should, uh, just to be clear, think that through at some point, not necessarily right now. But anyway, thank you, Wolfgang, for the clarification. Any other questions for Raya? Otherwise, we're running a little bit late, so maybe we should push on. We started a little bit late. The, thank you, Raya, very much. Thank you.